Hey guys, I am here with Jonathan and Richard from Sotheby's. They were kind enough to let us in for somewhat of a private viewing prior to their auction. Uh, so what are we gonna talk about? Two things, number one, I wanted to take it from the professionals to get their feel on what the auction environment looks like as of right now and what to expect going forward over the next six months to a year. And of course, last but not least, we're gonna look at a lot of kick-ass watches. So gentlemen, thank you once again for having us. Maybe just a quick introduction of what you do at Sotheby's for the viewers. Here, I'm Rich Lopez. I'm a senior watch specialist with Sotheby's based out of New York. I also cover Latin America. And I'm Jonathan Burford. I uh, cover watches from Los Angeles in our Beverly Hills office, and I cover Mexico and Canada and various other parts. And my brother in the vintage watch world needs no introduction. You guys know my friend Adam. <laughs> and uh, the one question I wanted to ask you and get your take, uh, what do you see on the East Coast as far as the overall mood? We're all aware that the market did take a dip in a certain, um, I guess, uh, aspect of the market. Some of the modern super hype stuff has taken a dip over the last couple of months. We've seen dips as high as 20, 30%, even though it's not a crash because pieces took a dip from trading at 3x MSRP down to 2x That's MSRP. still well over 2019 prices, right? It's, exactly. it's all relative. Exactly. And uh, I wanted to get your take and see what the feeling is out there, specifically in the auction world, because it's a bit of a different world. Well, from my take, I see that vintage is back again, and it's rightfully so. It's going to get the great prices that it deserves. Quality will always get top dollar. The prices with modern watches was amazing. It's great. It helped in other ways, but vintage. It's always got to be vintage. You always want the best of the best. We're seeing that good stuff is selling really well. You know, we, we had a, one of five 5970 salmon dials sell for one of 1.3 million in September, right? Really rare, really great stuff. People are going to fight for it because they might not have enough no opportunity. Quality but. vintage, like if you're looking for one of my favorite watches, a gold 6542 in all original condition, who knows when the next one's going to yeah. pop up. But that same, it correlates the same thing with modern, like a yeah. special Tiffany dial or a special salmon dial or some unique dial. Uh, those watches will stand the test of time because maybe they're modern now, but in 20 years, yeah. they're going to be neo vintage or vintage and they're special and they're rare. It's like you, you create a compelling reason for a buyer to something is fantastic quality or priced really aggressively or exceptionally rare, people are like, yeah, we'll go in. There's five, six, 10 bidders all coming into it. If there's something they think, you know what, maybe wait till January, see if the prices are dropped another yes. 5K. So you have to compete, create a compelling price for us as an auction house to get people bidding. Then when you get competitive bidding, that's when we see these exceptional prices. But it is with things like this, like you might have to wait two more years to find a really good one to right, come along. Exactly. Yeah, right, exactly. Like the exceptional piece that we had, the 15, 18 oh, pink on pink. Oh yeah. my God, that watch How many insane. bidders do we have for that? That was $10 million. Yeah, and you, you we had 27 is... registered bidders and up to $5 million, we still had something like nine guys on the phone. Because of this little scare in the market, you're going to end up with more consigners over the next six months? I mean, I thought we would into this sale. I genuinely, because we only closed the sale six, seven weeks ago. And I was like, in September, October time, thought we might have a bunch of stuff coming through. How many lots are in the sale? We've got 135 in the, in the printed catalog sale right. and with 318 in the online sale. No, so nice we're, we're selling like a considerable amount of watches. Yeah, this just... And also it's unusual. Like, do you think the takeaway from this, we've got million dollar watches in online sales. Oh, wow. people, are, people are comfortable wow. spending a million dollars on an online sale. Now. When we had a watch that BI'd in, in Switzerland at JPS before, and then a month later we put a single auction, a single lot auction uh, for the JPS right. in London, did $1.6 million. The difference with 2008 is in 2008, a bunch of guys just dumped their inventory. Yeah, they got scared, they liquidated, it crashed. But it was an actual crisis. Yeah, it was a real, yeah, yeah, tangible crisis. Now we're heading into what people call a normal recession. A lot, of the, a lot of the trade the auction houses are either more securely funded, so they're not worried, then they can ride out a storm. And also there's just the increase in buyers. There's more interest. We there's have 40% more of new buyers in every sale that we do. Sometimes that people buying one watch and done, they bought their, whatever it is for the rest of their life. And but there's a lot of people making... And we're getting consignments across the whole globe from places that yeah. we normally wouldn't get. It. If you looked at a December sale or even the June sale, we had a considerable amount of Royal Oaks and Nautiluses and Aquanauts, right? Those, we have three Nautiluses in here, I think three or four Aquanauts across the sales. And some of that is that some of the buyers have paid big money and they want to realize that. And we're saying, well, actually, the market shifted and you're going to have to readjust your expectations. But they're comfortable holding. Yeah, yes. yeah exactly. That's they're, the they're, they're, not, they're not, nobody's panicking and dropping these things, which is good because it gives us confidence. Well, whenever as a something, uh, one certain model runs up so high yeah. and there's so much interest, all of a sudden everybody rushes to yeah. sell because, like, I want to cash in, I want that crazy yeah. result yeah. too and make some money. The and so they flood not. the market, yeah. you know? Yeah. So you just have to ride out. I think there's also people who don't need to liquidate. But the, I mean, f from our point of view as an auction house and for you guys in the trade, like you have, we have clients that come to us and say, give me good advice. 
when the market's going like this, you can't give good advice. You can't give them, like, you can't say this is well, a great watch to hold it. So this- The one thing you could say is quality. If yeah, quality. Buy, buying quality. Always, always in quality. Quality. People ask me, they yeah. said, okay, Roman, I still have exposable income that I'd like to park. Yeah. My answer to them is this. The, the biggest issue in vintage, as I always seen it, is that you have a guy that sells a vintage watch, not necessarily something super expensive, but due to his lack of knowledge, he ends up selling a watch for somebody for X when it's really worth Y, what, it, because he didn't know about the insert, he didn't know about the dial, the condition, etc. But in, that's why I like working with you guys, by the way, because you guys actually have people on your team who understand what they're looking at. Yeah, yeah. Like, uh, truthfully, yeah. Uh, yeah. we've had a few years yeah. of experience. But yeah, yeah. I think you've been around for a while. I would agree with you on the on the vintage stuff, like quality. The other thing I think is going to be more apparent as we go forward is like. If you have a great watch and it's naked, it's going to be really Especially tough to sell. Especially now with Paddock, the way they yeah. want you to get an with archive. The you have to come to the auction house well, so for if, peace of mind. If you're yeah. looking for, not investment pieces, but like the, the um, triage between a really good example, complete in immaculate condition, and something that doesn't have its case back, doesn't have its uh, certificate, it's going to be yeah. a real, it's, uh, that'll be a much larger. Yeah, I mean, I think a, a lot of people look to the comfort of buying from an auction house kind of in the same yeah. way that the new buyers who with the the rolex uh, authentication pre-owned yes. system is going to be coming they just feel more comfortable buying from it's a comfort blanket place, yeah know? it's, it's a comfort blanket. to me when somebody asked me what is the next hype and i told them i think you can find those same blue chips in the modern oh, absolutely. 100%. and to me the, the vintage stuff starting you know if you want to talk lower pricing is going to be your older annual calendar paddocks and paddock is oh a my paddock. god your 50 35 your 50 we 36 your 51 46 yeah, all, those, all those things are going to be those blue chips because you know what that price has been steadily doing this you know but just you over at, a long you period of time you look at you know? a 50 35 uh, three four five years ago that was trading in the low to mid teens and today it's trading in the high teens and low 20s that's a huge increase right and the next thing people are looking for is value and complications. I talk to, I talk to them about things like the gyro turbion, right? Yeah. People have slept on a gyro turbion, specifically gyro turbion too, from Jaeger, probably one of the most complicated turbions out there right. to date, right? Me as a dealer of, 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 Same of with on, this. on a secondary market, this is the kind of stuff that I will look for in auctions. And yes, we do buy in auctions, guys. Contrary to all belief, we do buy pieces in auction. I'm pretty transparent about it. You've seen me talk about it. You know, I, I go to an auction house like Sotheby's and I start seeing them offer complications as a gyro and the estimate is 100 to 200. That's a steal. What was the and retail on it? Yeah, right, the retail yeah. was 578,000 Swiss francs. But it's the largest reverser that they make. You actually correct them earlier. I thought it was the triptych, but this is the largest reverser case that they make. It's a big, hefty watch. A lot of people complain about the reverser being a small watch. This is not a small watch. When Nautilus, Aquanaut, so those prices go to that sort of extreme, and then you see something like this coming along, and so it's, it's, it's time only like this is what I'm talking about. Yeah. Even to, even today, even today, if you want to compare, if you want to compare market to hyper stuff that has yeah. calmed down, right? A 5980 Nautilus will trade around yeah. that price yeah. in rose gold, right? You're looking at uh, 50, even the 5990s in steel are inching up to that lower uh, reserve that you have on this. I but I want to move on to something I'm completely biased with, and that's Audemars Piguet being my favorite brand. Some of the older grand comps. This is a minute repeater, perpetual calendar, split second chronograph automatic. Even if this thing goes for, let's call it 200,000. How do you oversee this versus an RM1103? Yeah. It's different buyers. Different. That's the problem. Like that, I'm 100% with is you, watch but, but you're talking about a, two different. This is about predicting the future. And I think you're going to start people taking their minds off of the fact that, oh, the shape is the most popular, most recognizable, and saying, yeah, yeah. holy shit, I have a minute repeat of perpetual calendar split second. People yeah. develop as, as collectors, right? They, they start buying, and so many people start with a Submariner, and then they get into maybe a deep sea, or they, like you start thinking about what you're buying, and then you develop, and then you get into the cool stuff. Yeah. And I'm gonna shift yeah. over to independence, yeah. and the reason I wanna do that is because this is the one I call the one that got away. I've owned, <laughs> I've owned, I've owned this watch in 2005 or six for $14,000, and I ended up selling it for like, I think like $18,000. I think independence is where it's going to be. The rise of the independence. They already have risen, though. I mean, it's nothing new, you know? Not to the utmost capability. <sighs> well, look at Jorn. Jorn's already on. Uh, Jorn's a blue chip. Jorn is a blue chip. But can they you even call Jorn an independent? Yeah. No. I mean, they make no, it's not, not anymore. Watches. It's come yeah, out of that. Not, but any hot independent, yeah. whether, you know, it's Rexep or whoever, this. You can't get any of them. On hand, I'm, you know? I'm looking at stuff that's but, still accessible. Yeah. MBNF, I'm looking at Herbert. Can I'm you say MBNF is accessible? MBNF mm. is accessible. Mm. It is. I have six in stock, but then again, I... I've got collectors who buy his pieces and they feel like patrons of the brand, right? They've been buying since yeah. even coming out and they feel invested. And I think that's why a lot of people gravitate towards independence. Like look at Philippe Dufour. I've heard yeah. he's very, I've never met him, but I've heard he's yeah. very accessible too, very nice to talk to. Yeah, yeah. A lot of these guys, they'll actually engage you in conversation. We've got a Peter Speak Marin up there that is 
unbelievably beautiful platinum tourbillon. This thing is hand-fitted, like, like it's 20 grand. Like what can you get for 20 grand? And this thing is, so there is still value in that market, but you've got to look hot. Well, now that you're talking about Indies, yeah, we, should, we should talk about our, our friend Ryan. All right, so very honorable mention, my friend Ryan from Aventi has come a long way. He went from walking around Switzerland and asking the Swiss to make him a cheaper, affordable tourbillon, and they all turned him down. So he ended up going to Asia to create his first line, and now Switzerland is in line to make his next line, and now he's come out with a new piece. He's he accomplished doesn't? exactly what he wanted to accomplish. He got the Swiss to make a, an, affordable, an affordable Turbion. Turbion, alternative you know, cases with, with uh, crystal and different color crystals. When he sent me the event he watched a couple of years back to review on my YouTube channel, I told him, I was like, I'm gonna be honest, I'm gonna tell you exactly how it is. And everybody in the comments was saying, oh, this brand is not gonna be around, this brand's gonna, he's gonna die. Well, guess what? Here he is, uh, one of the most prestigious uh, auction houses. His watch has a current bid of $30,000 and it's not gonna stop there when the auction goes, when the auction ends. So, very happy for Ryan. It gives, it gives buyers reassurance, right? They know that there's a market for them outside of just and for sure. Sure. And what I understand, kids. he's got a strong private market, a lot of followers. One of the Shark Tank guys is also wears yeah. his watches too. So which is, I, I wanna switch gears to a watch that was 5970 specifically, uh, again, in starting with white gold, rose gold, yellow gold, and then moving all the way out to platinum. I mean, this was probably the hottest selling watch leading up to 2008 crisis, at least was in the rose gold and the white gold metal. This is not, that was not the time of the Nautilus, that was the time of their grand complication yeah, line. 100%. And 5970s had withstood this, the test of time. You got this guy estimated three to $400,000. And remember, this is when perpetual calendars ruled the world. Yeah. When I first started working, not Nautiluses. Yeah, yeah, it was man. like perpetual calendar, perpetual calendar, and if you didn't have a little coin in your pocket you went to an annual calendar yeah. exactly. that's how it was when you first got into paddocks no one cared about steel sport watches at that time at its highest nautiluses were the chronos were fetching about fifty five thousand. but remember Max. this is 5970 3970 came before that and 2499s 1580 if you want to narrow down i use the vintage market as an example say okay well this dial was only made for a year or this thing was only made for this long that's how you narrow you down from the millions of watches yeah. And the one thing that always narrows it down is going to be a special dial, yeah. and specifically the Tiffany oh. dial. So if you're someone where you have a little coin, like Richard said, I highly recommend parking those funds in something that's Tiffany super stamp. Rare. It's super rare. That's so, similar like in the vintage world. With this is 6264, so it's a made for between a year and 18 months, yeah, we reckon. Around a year, yeah. Yeah, all the lemon version ones have been 14 that have come to market. Yeah. There's been 100 serial numbers between those. Right. And like, this is fresh to market. Yeah, exactly. So these are you know, these just genuinely intrinsically rare things. We know they right. are. Like, so tell me about this watch, by the well, way. Before, before, before you go into this watch, oh, yeah, so you right. can just help me make my point. And the point of this is that people always say, well, what is this worth? I say it's worth what one is willing to pay for yeah, it because sure. on the next roundabout, you're going to see it fetch a price, a bigger price most of the time right. because this is a watch that it's a 20% minus a 20% plus becomes irrelevant because yeah. go find another. It could fetch a lot more if 18K. for one day Tiffany is no longer sold by exactly. you know, it's good. Well they don't put, they won't stamp dials yeah. and grand right. comms. So. Well so let's introduce what the watch is. It is an 18 karat gold 6264. Paul Newman nicknamed the lemon. It was called a lemon dial because of the shade of the color dial. It's like a grenet, like kind of right, matte, softer. Granny, yeah, right. softer yellow and has white print in the registers, which is different. Um, they're very, very, very rare. There's only been a dozen that have popped 14, up. I think I was looking today, 14, I think. Yeah, yeah. not many pop up. So the lemon dial came in this case and then it also came in a screw down uh, oyster case. Of which yeah. there's there's, well, I sold one that was a 6265, the only 6265 known. There have been three or four in 6263 cases that have come to auction. That's like that the could... holy grail uh, gold Paul Newman Daytona. I think this is one step below it. Uh, this is interesting. Right, it comes from Mexico. It's on a Mexican made bracelet. Right. It's a really beautifully supple vintage bracelet. It's really, it's a lovely watch. And I'm talking to me about this. Original family. Okay, these are some of my favorite uh, vintage Rolex. Ones, so, ones. yeah, reference 8171 Patalone, if you will. Uh, just, you got to consider when these were made, you know, 40s, 50s. Uh, the size of them, the complication, triple date moon phase. Uh, they're just incredible. They're 38 millimeters, incredible watches. These two, I mean, well, I was looking at them. Well, they had to be that big to fit. 
towards Zenit. Yeah. Understood. Yes. But they, put, they, they had the 6062 as well. So they made a version with a screw down case yes. and a smaller right. case. Right, exactly. This is a larger case snapback. Exactly. Um, you two, never see two in that auction. Two in one auction, <laughs> I, but also, I've, I've the seen I, was two just looking, I was just looking at the serial, serial numbers, numbers, and serial numbers are incredibly close together. <laughs> Both cases are like razor sharp on polish. This yellow gold one like has beautiful patina. And I actually, you know, we were talking about like condition quality. Uh, I think there's a place though for watches that are maybe not perfect, but they have a beautiful like rich uh, aging that is worth collecting. Yeah. And that's a perfect example of it. So yeah, maybe it won't fetch the same. I mean, we've seen steel 8171's mint condition for over a million dollars, oh, yeah. you know? This is so, estimate two to four. I'm willing to bet over the high estimate on this piece. Yeah. It should be, I think somewhere yeah, within, the within, within the estimate, within the estimate, you know? So, but the case is razor sharp. The patina is nice and even across the dial. It's got like a cool, like blue on the top and like more of like a, a rosy patina on the bottom. It's really cool looking. I think when you look at you these know? ones, especially watches in this era. Gorgeous like you, Yeah, th when a case is as sharp as these ones, you want the dial to be similar. Like the, the right. watch has to tell its history all over it. So everything about these, like you're always looking for the, the crown and the case number engraved on the case back. Most of the 8171s that pop up are refinished dials yeah. because it was just a common thing. The dial got a little damaged like this. And I'm surprised this one wasn't. You take it to the watchmaker, he repaints it, he re, you know, rewrites Rolex. It's very hard to find original pieces, you know, and I would much rather have it original with this beautiful patina yeah. than obviously refinished and, and look perfect, you yeah. know. It just, this patina on the dial is absolutely beautiful. When it right. comes to Newman's, you don't want that sort of patina no, on the dial. You don't want hand drag, you don't want dirt, you want, you want all the loom dots. Like right. it's a, as you as you go through the vintage watches, you're looking for different little things, sure. and like that's why, like you guys in the vintage, like, as dealers, we we're auction, we're, we're we're specialists, but we're also generalists, right? We do everything from clocks, pocket watches. We have to cover everything. That's why we work with we work with the trade with you guys because right. you guys specialize in this stuff as much as anybody. Yeah, I know um, Adam likes the next watch a lot. My <laughs> favorite sports Rolex reference is the GMT. Jeez. First of all, and my favorite GMT is the original yeah. 6542 yeah. Bakelite. Uh, I'm not a solid gold guy. I can only, I can't wear a watch on a gold bracelet, only on a strap, but the 6542s in gold are very, very special. You know, they're very, very special because you gotta think of why they were made in solid gold at the time. Like, who were they marketing this watch to? They were, mar they were making these steel watches for pilots, yeah. you know, for people who it needed to tell to them. I mean, yeah. It was a tool watch, but who really needed a gold 6542 in 1958, 57, 57? The guys like, that, you know, flew the private plane. You know, and that's, <laughs> I mean, what, what else they, could they be? They didn't make a lot of them. <laughs> they, <laughs> they didn't make a lot of them. Did they have PJs back then even? <laughs> for every 30, uh, six five four twos in steel. You maybe see one. Well, that's yeah. why they you know? they went with the Concorde later on because it would be Concorde pilots. <laughs> yeah. So for me, it's a really special watch. It's rivet bracelet, Bakelite, yeah, bezels intact. Original intact. bracelet, yeah, intact. Exactly. Some of those bezels oh, get the swapped dial out. Is just nice like and sharp. Well, a lot of the times the bezels are cracked, so they're either replaced or they're refilled. Uh, you know, the radium is scooped out and yeah. redone with you know tritium or something Thoughts like that. Thoughts on the condition on this? Uh, condition's very very nice. The case has been polished before, but you know most have respectfully. Bezels all original with like one tiny hairline. Overall, really good bezel. Uh, really hard to find. And the dials, the dials gorgeous. The dials, the dials, I think is what it is. The dials, the dials, dials absolutely gorgeous. Yeah, no, this is, it's hard to find them like this. And whoever buys this, I bet it's hard to find them, period. Not it's hard to find them, like period, but it's even doubly hard to find them in this condition. So I think whoever whoever walks away with this is going to be maybe, happy. Maybe, because, maybe uh, it'll be us. <laughs> we can try. Give it the old college try, you know? Uh, you know, the biggest question today. And the biggest question is asked of us every single day is, hey, what's going on in the market? What's going to happen in the future? Blah, 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 blah. This is the number one question. So I wanted to guys give you a different take on this, both from the secondary market as well as the auction market. And as you can see, you have a lot of options out there in terms of having the confidence to park a little bit of change in this little hobby we love called watches. And the options that we discussed is first and foremost was the vintage. And I've talked about this during every market, right? Those are your blue chips, but there are other blue chips out there. Number one, your, in, your older independence, your up and coming independence. Number two, high complications in the like of this Jara Turbion or a Grand Complication AP. If you're looking to park a tremendous amount of money where it doesn't matter if it's 20% plus or 20% minus, you go for some of the more rare stuff, which is still considered modern, let's say a Tiffany stamp 5970P in the likes of the watch I'm holding in my hand. So you do have a lot of options out there in the market. As you can see, the auction houses aren't panicking, the secondary market are not panicking, and you shouldn't panic neither. The best part about today's market and the biggest advantage you have today as a buyer today, and yes, today is a buyer's market, is you're no longer 
stuck with the panic of FOMO, of having to hurry up and pay for it because there's somebody else standing in line. You now have time to really open your eyes, take off the blinders and say, oh, look at all the options I have, both from a horological perspective, complication perspective, collectability perspective, overall look, be it an independent, be it a vintage watch, or be it something as avant-garde as this eventy. But now you don't have to rush to the door to be the first guy in line in order to be able to pick that up. You can actually take your time, do your research. Buy what you love. Buy what you love. Yeah, yeah. And the best part about it, as Rich and, and Jonathan, it. and wear it, right. It's not an investment, wear it, enjoy it, but it's still a safe place to put money, according to JP Morgan, Bloomberg, and now Roman Sharp. So with that said, guys, I want to thank you so but much. But don't blame him if the watch goes down. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> with, that, with that said, I, want, I wanted to thank you so much, first right. of all, for, Disclaimer. Op for opening your doors to us, for showing some of these wonderful pieces. Uh, and really, it was nice to get a, a completely different perspective, and that is from a major auction house such as Sotheby's. Thank you guys again. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Our pleasure. Thank thank you. You. Thanks for coming down. Thanks. Guys, don't forget, like, comment, share, subscribe. Thank you very much to our hosts here at Sotheby's once again. We'll see you on the next one.